Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the meeting today. It's a pleasure to be part of this event, not only as a speaker, but as a member of the planning committee as well. Uh, in this presentation, I'll discuss some selected cases in liver transplantation, focusing on uh, how intra-OPT played a crucial role man in managing unexpected hemodynamic complications. Uh, before I begin, I declare that I have no... Recording in progress. And this uh, still frame shows the flow convergence in the uh, vena contracta, and we classified this TR as at least moderate. Mediaxophageal RV inflow outflow showing normal circumferential shortening of the RV. You can see the PA catheter close to the RVOT down there. And here we appreciate the same TR jet that we saw before in the four chambers. With a minimal, I would say, trace BI in the RVOT. The uh, continuous wave Doppler of the TR jet gave us uh, an estimated R. My Recording video. in progress. RV inflow outflow reinforced the significant drop in the preload to the heart. So chambers view showing empty LV as well. And the long axis shows the same, also showing absence of uh, SEM, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. And all these findings, they are quite common during clamping. They are compatible with severe hypovolemic, hypovolemia which uh, is usually managed with some fluid administration and vasopressors. However, in this patient specifically, I'd say that a larger than usual amount of fluids was necessary to achieve a tolerable hemodynamic situation. 
Um, and uh, that was possibly due to some lack of collateral circulation or insufficient collateral circulation. So the patient received approximately four liters of fluids, uh, and that included crystalloids, 5% uh, albumin, and one unit of red cells. And that was all during the unhepatic phase. And then uh, as we proceed to the reperfusion, the situation became very complicated. So the echocardiogram initially showed right ventricular distension, as you can see, and that was different from the initial exam. The RV inflow outflow showed good reperfusion of the graft with these uh, artifacts that resemble air bubbles, but actually are uh, cold fluid mixed with blood coming from the graft. And the LV now was uh, less empty than during the unhepatic phase, but we were expecting a larger chamber uh, with, uh, you know, as a surrogate of a higher cardiac output due to the uh, significant increase in preload to the RV. And we had the same impression when you look at the long axis view. And then the right ventricle began to show signs of failure with the lateral wall displaying reduced contractility now, directly correlating with the uh, left ventricle's difficulty in maintaining adequate cardiac output due to underfilling. So you can see septal deviation to the left side. And this patient eventually progressed to right ventricular ballooning with almost no feeling on the left side of the heart. And that culminated with a cardiac arrest in PEA. So we initiated resuscitation with adrenaline and chest compressions, and we managed to restore spontaneous circulation after a couple rounds of uh, CPR. Still, the echocardiogram revealed signs of stasis, uh, possible small clot in the right atrium, indicating potentially a thrombus formation due to low float state during the cardiac arrest. And we used inotropic support and uh, pulmonary vasodilatation with nitric oxide to stabilize the patient. And that allowed the surgery to be completed. Good cardiac output was restored. And at the end of the procedure, we basically had a hyperdynamic normal functioning heart. The RV showing basically a normal systolic function, four chambers and kind of an RV inflow outflow. But you can see good uh, fractional RF shortening, good circumferential shortening here. And same for the LV in the four chambers and two chambers view. And here's a long axis. Uh, although this patient had an extended ICU length of stay, he eventually was discharged home with a good function of the liver graft, no neurological deficits, which was a positive outcome given the extremely critical intraoperative scenario. Moving on to our second case today, we have a 50 years old patient with cirrhosis from uh, metabolic disease, MELT-score 25, child bug C12. Patient had a history of uh, hepatic decompensation with encephalopathy and ascites, and a recent uh, GI scope showed large esophageal varices with no signs of active bleeding. He also had a history of uh, insulin-dependent diabetes, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, asthma, GERD, and psoriasis. Uh, this patient's preoperative echo also seemed quite favorable, showing a hyperdynamic left ventricle with an EF between 65 and 70 percent, normal right heart, uh, and a coronary angiogram that showed no uh, coronary artery disease. So this is the interop echo that initially showed normal biventricular systolic function. Looking at the RV specifically, this again, uh, little enlarged 
due to fluid overloads, uh, overload from cirrhosis that I've mentioned before. We even had this uh, 3D of the RV confirming normal systolic function. You can have a good you know, sense of RV function using the 3D image at the top of your screen. However, after reperfusion, you know, the patient had a hemodynamic collapse, which we quickly identified through a TE to be caused by this massive thrombosis extending from the IVC into the right atrium and ventricle. What was practically blocking the blood flow through the heart. You can note the uh, complete deviation of the interatrial septum to the left and the left ventricle completely empty, unable to be filled uh, adequately. RV inflow outflow shows the massive clot crossing the RV. In this situation required an emergency intervention. We, we end up administering alteplase in incremental doses while performing CPR. And TE was crucial in monitoring the response to alteplase, uh, and that gradually showed the clots uh, decrease in sign, in size, and uh, normalization of blood flows. As you can see here, size of the clot smaller. There is systolic activity in the RV, still dysfunctional, but with contractility present. And here, 30 minutes after the TPA, there's almost resolution of the clot with uh, what I would call a normal RV systolic function, at least in this view. Close to the end of the procedure, we couldn't see clot in the heart anymore. And at that point, the patient had minimal hemodynamic support. However, the process, as you could imagine, uh, was not without any uh, bleeding complications. The thrombolysis without the place in the surgical setting led to a bleeding of uh, very difficult control. And the patient required massive blood transfusions to achieve a reasonable hemostasis and eventually was taken to the ICU with the abdomen still open, requiring a take back to the OR a few days later for hemostasis and uh, procedure completion. This patient also did well with the liver graft functioning properly and no neurological deficits being discharged home after, uh, after a few weeks. And to wrap up the third case, this uh, involves a 64 years old patient with a complex history of decompensated cirrhosis. This patient had a previous uh, TEPS procedure due to refractory ascites, had also an alcoholization of uh, hepatic nodule and additionally, he presented with a partial non-occlusive portal vein thrombosis. That was an incidental finding at the time of the diagnosis of HCC. Patients pre-op TTE, like in the other cases, did not show any significant abnormalities. Left ventricle with normal size, hyperdynamic, EF 70-75, right ventricle completely normal in both uh, size and function. And the uh, intra T at the beginning of the procedure showed a normal LVOT without any signs of flow acceleration um, or LVOT obstruction, as you can see. This patient had a normal mitral valve with a normal mitral valve leaflet size as well. However, patient developed uh, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve which we call SAM after the clamping of the IVC. That's a phenomenon where the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve moves towards the LVOT during systole. And this displacement can cause LVOT obstruction and significant mitral regurg. We usually use the four chambers in the long axis view to identify it. That's a steel frame, the mediaxophageal four chambers and it shows the, the kink in the anterior mitral valve leaflet towards the LVOT in the gap in the coaptation of the mitral valve. And that's the cause 
of a significant posterior mitral regurgitant jet with a premature closure of the aortic valve and low cardiac output. I understand this is a very busy and clutter uh, color flow Doppler. And so I have slowed down the loop to let you appreciate EMR being generated during late systole. And here's a steel frame demonstrating the uh, severe jet posteriorly directed with acceleration in the LVOT. Here's another loop now in long axis to show the deviation of the coaptation point in the anterior mitrally flat towards the LVOT. And this uh, slow image, slow loop, uh, shows the generation of the MR jet that you can see now. And in this case, uh, hypovolemia contributed to the development of SAN after clamping. And so to treat it, we gave fluids, phenylephrine, and also a beta blocker to control heart rate. In this case, we used Esmolol. Um, and as, as you can see, TE confirmed the complete resolution of SAM after these interventions with uh, anterior mitral leaflet returning uh, completely to its normal position. The mitral regurge almost completely disappeared now with a very small uh, central jet that was probably there before and normal flows in the LVOT as well. And this zoomed uh, long axis view shows normal mitral valve coaptation, complete resolution of SAM, still with the clamp on. However, uh, after the clamp was removed and during reperfusion, SAM reappeared, but now exacerbated by a significant drop in the SVR and peripheral vasodilatation despite adequate venous return. Once again, echo was crucial in guiding our treatment, which involved strict heart rate control and peripheral vasoconstriction to avoid, and we avoided in this case, volume overload because we knew there was a lot of uh, preload. And with these interventions, we managed to stabilize the patient who was transferred to the ICU stable without any uh, need for beta blockers and with minimal vasopressor support. This loop shows uh, normal outflow tracts, color flow droplet, minimal central MR, and that's in the end of the procedure. And this patient had an eventful post-operative course and was discharged from hostel within the expected time frame. In conclusion, three cases presented today, uh, they demonstrate the importance of uh, interop TE uh, in patients undergoing liver transplants. In all cases, despite a normal extensive pre-op investigation, the patients develop an expected hemodynamic collapses during surgery. The first case, right ventricular failure post reperfusion. Um, second case, uh, massive thrombosis identified by echo, and uh, echo also used to guide thrombolysis and resuscitation. Uh, third case, the development of SAM during surgery it was quickly diagnosed and treated, demonstrating how TE can be vital for early detection of complications and for guiding real time therapeutic interventions. Uh, this case, they reinforce the message that uh, TE is an indispensable tool in the intra-op uh, management of patients undergoing liver transplants. Not only allows rapid and accurate identification of hemodynamic complications, but also effective guides therapeutic interventions. And that significantly contributes to procedural success and improved patient outcomes. Uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation and the opportunity to participate in this high-level event available for questions during the QA session. Thank you very much. Perfect, Rafael, thanks so much for that. And uh, so I'm happy to 
move over to the Q&A session where we have our speakers. Uh, Dr. Kuzman Guta couldn't uh, join us this afternoon, but uh, all the other speakers are here to answer questions. So I'll just start rolling out by uh, one of the questions I have actually for Jake, something that we see at our center sometimes, which is um, in patients that have uh, secondary pulmonary hypertension due to LV failure, um, when you do preoperative swans and you see that they have elevated PA pressures, uh, what's the approach at your center for normalizing those before transplant in order to try to minimize RV failure? Um, uh, so, I mean, what usually I've had experience with is if they're not uh, optimized beforehand, either with diuretics or uh, pulmonary vasodilators like sildenafil, um, they're not even heart transplant candidates. So uh, if they've been optimized on medical management and they've had an improvement or a response to the um, medications, um, then they'll obviously be listed. So then in the operating room, we'll, I, I, usually I'll even start them on nitric as soon as we induce. And then uh, if it's uh, still severe, depending on RV dysfunction and things like that. Uh, I might even have the uh, surgeons put in uh, wires into the groin before inducing. Um, so that's usually what I've done in the past. Um, I'm sure people have many different opinions, but um, that's usually the kind of stepwise I've, I've gone through with it. Well, I think the situation that happens here sometimes is that we have a patient that is not necessarily known to have supremely elevated pulmonary pressures, mm. but then they're managed as an outpatient. They may or may not be on a cardio mem system. And when they come in for their actual transplant, the preoperative um, PA line shows that they do have elevated pressure. So then the question is, you know, we can aggressively try to get those down with medical management, melanone diuretics in the acute period within like eight mm. hours of transplant. But then, you know, when you go to sleep and you induce anesthesia and you initiate positive pressure ventilation is very different strategy. And I don't think we have a consistent cutoff where which we say, okay, we're not going to go ahead with this transplant versus the ones where we try to get through. Um, do you have a number or like, I know it's, there's no like kind of right answer, but do you have a number in your head that, that uh, you usually try to target before proceeding? Um, I mean, I, I don't know of any data behind the specific number, um, but usually what I've dealt with is uh, making sure that they're well sedated, have a lot of like opioids on board, they're paralyzed, um, uh, make sure the volume status is good, and then measure, make sure the number is real. And then um, if they need dialysis, some, I, I have seen um, us do uh intraoperative CRRT to try and get some uh, volume off uh, quickly and see how the uh, uh, pulmonary pressures change with it. Um, and then also with adding the nitric and seeing how they respond. Um, and then kind of just discussing with the surgeon, like, is this a good patient? Do they have other comorbidities involved? Is this strictly just a, a, a type two pulmonary hypertension? Um, is there renal failure things like that? Um, and then it's kind of like a, a multidisciplinary decision, um, but it, it's, it's not an easy answer. I, I think generally speaking, um, like two thirds systemic is probably where I would kind of start thinking like, hey, I don't know if this is a great choice, but um, definitely the conversation with the surgeon would be at least with half systemic. I think one of the things that maybe differs between uh, Canada and the U.S. is that uh, what we hear anyway is that the U.S. surgeons are much more aggressive in terms of putting them on uh, LVADs as they wait for mm. versus Canada. But it's just something that's going to be center specific as well. Okay, we have a question from the chat, which is, uh, has anybody demonstrated improved outcomes with the use of TE for lung transplant? I'll open this up for Yilliam and Jen. I think Jane already was uh, addressing the question. Jane, you want to go ahead and... Um... Yeah, sure. Uh, we have, I don't think there's anything that out there that has demonstrated specifically that TE uh, for lung transplant has improved the outcomes. And I think that comes, that ties together with um, Annette's question and Marchin, who has texted me about this as well. Um, it's just the decision-making process for addressing stenosis, compression, a kinking of an anastomosis is not just we see it, fix it. First of all, you have all kinds of things that affect your measurements. Uh, and two, 
um, you know, just because you fix something doesn't mean that it can make it better. And so I think it's just, it's so specific to each patient and the surgeon uh, and, you know, the donor lungs, the recipient lungs. I don't, it, I think it'd be very hard to prove that this is gonna affect your outcome. I, I, I mean, I, I agree. I think that the, uh, with the absence of uh, randomized, you know, controlled trial, it's very hard to say this is a standard of care, you know, uh, the TE will, you know, uh, definitely, you know, improve outcome and whoever is not using TE, you know, is, uh, you know, under standard of care, we never can do that. I think that it's just a risk benefit decision uh, that you will, you know, uh, discuss with the patient, the surgeons, the team. Um, as Jane, I think, addressed in the, in the QIA section, if you have a patient that is coming for a single lung transplant, no RV dysfunction, you know, uh, I mean, sick, but not that sick, probably a TE will not make a difference. Now, when you're talking, uh, you know, about a patient that has CVR, you know, RV failure, coming for a double lung transplant, patient that is in an uh, ECMO or will need the ECMO or CPV, and uh, you're going to be doing cannulation and, you know, very complex case. So probably, you know, the risk benefit, you know, will, you know, tell you that a TE will be a good idea, but it's not definite. And just uh, as a poll, just for context, would you say that, uh, like, what percentage of liver and lung transplants at your center get routine transesophageal echocardiography? I'll say 100%. 100%? We need all of our lung transplants. And the liver? Yes, 100%. 100% of livers as well. Yeah. The surgeons actually loved it. <laughs> Sometimes they want the answer of the complications, you know, be given by us and by the TE, which sometimes is impossible. I mean, I have to be honest with you. Sometimes we're doing a, a, a TE in a lung transplant and the, the patient is so hyperdynamic and the heart is so compressed that you can't really see anything. Mm -hmm. And the answer is not there. Right. But somehow they feel like, okay, if you can give me some answers, you know, I know what to do. So it's sort of like, you know, choice. Uh, and do we, we use it for every case, honestly. That's useful. Justify, probably not, but we do. Uh, Raphael, how about uh, at London experience? How many uh, liver transplants get TE there routinely? Yeah, it's close to 100%, uh, Marcus. Yeah, that's the routine um, standard of care here. Only if there is any contraindication. I don't remember having one recently, maybe active bleeding uh, from the GI tract. But uh, other than that, all, all patients get it. We, we, one caveat to that is that we don't do transgastric views here. Okay. Uh, we sit in the esophagus and we believe that that's enough to guide us with the um, you know, most uh, complex scenarios. Uh, as you saw in my uh, slides, many of our patients, not many, but some of our patients, the sickest ones, they still get a PA catheter, uh, which also guides us with some uh, you know, management for SVR, PVR, uh, but the TE is a standard of care here, 100%. Mm -hmm. That's and Jen, uh, just go to go back to your slides about uh, pulmonary vein, uh, like flow velocities and evidence of turbulence. Um, that we often see that here, and we report it often. I, I say I can't always convince the surgeon that it's going to be hemodynamically or clinically significant, though. Um, and what percent? Like, do, do they often accept higher flows given the clinical context, or is it? Do you yeah. have a high degree of revisions where they? No, no, I, I, I don't. I can't even recall off the top of my head any time I've reported higher flows that the surgeon has gone back and fixed it. I'm even trying to think back in Toronto, if they've gone back, yeah, they're yeah. like, no, it's going to be fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just, I just wonder, like, so it's, it makes me wonder whether we're using kind of uh, outdated values, whether higher flow velocities are acceptable in lung transplant, because it doesn't seem to necessarily correlate with worse outcomes, despite with some of the papers from maybe 10 years ago would suggest, but I, I don't know the answer. No, I, I agree. Well, first of all, I think you are going to see higher flows regardless, even if there is no problem. Uh, you know, they're hyperdynamic. You're on ECMO, maybe on bypass. Like those are just going to affect your flows. So I think you are going to see that. And, um, you know, those structures are obviously very delicate to just say, go fix it. I don't know if there's a risk there. I think there's a big risk there. Also, but, but, you know, I do rely on it for someone personally, I'm very stingy with fluid management and lung transplants. So it's really nice for me to be like, oh, okay, we can do another 500 cc's and, and, you know, I'm not going to blow up the RV. Yeah. 
No, it's useful. I, I think that I remember um, one of our transplant surgeons uh, when we hired him, uh, and you know we did interview, and he was upset with assessment of the pulmonary veins, you know, during the transplant. And the only question that he asked about the anesthesiologist doing the TE is that do they know how to do it? Mm -hmm. And he was so upset. That's all he cares. He didn't care about any other, you know, thing. And it's funny because we do it in every case. So in one case, I actually told him like, hey, listen, you, you know, the velocities are very, very high. And he looked at me and say like, okay, what do you want me to do about it? And I was like, Oh, <laughs> it was like, you have been obsessed, you know, and now we finally are telling <laughs> you, okay, they are super high and you are asking me what to do about it. So yeah, usually they don't do anything. They just sort of like watch it. And sometimes we get called to the um, uh, unit later when the patient is not doing well and there is no other answer, like why the patient is not doing so well. So we get called to the ICU to, could you please interrogate the pulmonary veins uh, again? and see if that is the answer. So maybe we can extend it or maybe we can do something about it. We had the issue, and I don't know if this is a, a happening in any in other institution, but we have an issue that some of our cardiologists, um, interventional cardiologists, they are not really used to make sure pulmonary vein flows. Yeah. So when they get called to the uh, bedside to do it, they usually ask for the cardiac anesthesiologist, can you do it? This is not something that I do every day. So that's why we get involved, you know, later in the ICU. Unless the ICU person is a cardiac, you know, an SSO, you're someone that is, uh, you know, T35. And just to appreciate difference, differences in practice, um, here, uh, I know Jen will be able to, to attest to, um, in lung transplant, they're a little bit resistant to use inotropy only because they feel that uh, it may uh, contribute to worsening of pulmonary pressures in a post, uh, you know, transplant period. Um, do you use echo to guide your inotropic decisions, or do you tend to use more vasoconstrictors in the acute perioperative period and then transition later? Basically, similar to what you guys do, we start with norepi. Um, and, and, but the, the difference is that we hook up inhaled nitric oxide for everybody. For everyone, yeah, 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 yeah. But if there's a question, it's more of a question later. If there's already dysfunction, no one's going to complain about norinone or epi. I know that was a thing where you had to have a discussion with the surgeons in Toronto, but here I, they're way more relaxed about it. But again, we do start off inhaled nitric from the beginning with everybody. Everybody. Routine administration. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think Marcin has a question. We'll go, uh, Marcin, do you want to? Uh, thank you guys for your excellent presentations. Uh, well, it's uh, you partially answer my question. It looks like that practicing solid organ transplantation mandates echo. Um, that's true that in our center, we, we don't do it routinely for lungs or livers, but uh, maybe we just become lazy or or it's just uh, believing in our own practice. But uh, the examples, Raphael, examples which you've shown, we saw it many times with our livers, some um, uh, MIs, yeah, liver transplants. We know that 20% of candidates developed uh, coronary artery disease, um, thrombosis. Uh, we have also paradoxical emboli in patients with portopulmonary syndrome, where amount of air going through collaterals was so big that patients were going to RV failure. We could see it very clearly. Uh, the question is, uh, especially in states, uh, what about certification? If you are lung transplant anesthesiologist or liver transplant anesthesiologist, do you need to be certified echocardiographer or this is just basic exams and findings are so obvious that that maybe basic training is enough? What What is your opinion? Uh, I, you know, I, in my residency, the liver team was not cardiac trained and they put TEs for their liver transplants and it was just... There was, they were just expected to be able to manage, you know, it was treated like a, a rescue echo, but throughout the entire case, and they didn't have any major issues. If there was something, some crazy finding, you know, there's always a cardiac anesthesiologist around to ask, but I don't, there was no issue and they were expected to do it from basic training. I think from the survey that I uh, showed in my slides uh, from 2024, most of the people were not certified actually for liver transplant. 
So I think that was one of the downsides. I can share my experience here in London. Um, we are a small group of consultants that do levers. Uh, there is, as Dr. Guta showed in his presentation, there is a significant overlap between cardiac and uh, liver transplants. At a point that right now, five out of the eight are cardiac consultants as well, but the requirements have been, this, uh, for the next hirees, uh, have been, it has been decided that they have to be TE certified. The, for the ones right now that are not certified, they were grandfathered, but they are still training TE on a daily basis with us. And we always do the transplants in two consultants uh, with one of them being a TE certified person. So we are moving towards uh, a direction where TE is a requirement for, TE certification is a requirement for liver transplant uh, anesthesia. That's interesting to hear. Martin, any follow-up question? No, I think it's, uh, it's uh, Rafael, this is a very good point. Um, on one hand, as Jen mentioned, this is rescue, which is, and I know that in US, most of residents now I get a basic training, but uh, because sometimes these decisions are so difficult and we need to, to make them quickly, probably having certification, uh, it, it puts extra weight on, on what comes from our end because the consequences from surgical reintervention are, are sometimes very significant for pulmonary veins i agree with you i mean we know that outcome is worse the lung is congested but the options what to do with them is, is very limited if they try to redo it surgically it usually makes it even worse and even if you do stenting it's also not the most straightforward and it's very tricky um so uh but but i liver you are right rafael liver is so complex with, with lung or heart, we can always crash back on pump or neck more, regroup, rethink. With liver, we can just shoot ourselves, yeah? There is no rescue. So that's, that's that, and decision must be made very quickly. So it's a very good point. You're correct. We had uh, five, for the past, I wanna say three, four years, we had five intraoperative uh, massive thrombosis after release of the clamp. Uh, all of them were treated right away with uh, TPA. Of course, we had to deal with the bleeding afterwards, but uh, um, none of the patients died in the OR, and four of them were discharged from the hospital eventually, which is way different from what you see if you search the literature in terms of mortality for intraoperative uh, thrombosis. I think the administration of alteplase in a very fresh clot uh, basically dissolves the clot uh, for uh, and, and it helps. Uh, you know, reestablish hemodynamics uh, at some point. It's very sobering to think about um, from our from our side only because I would say we were still we're still at the place where we use uh, T in the minority of liver transplants. I'd probably say in the realm of kind of like maybe twenty five percent or less, uh, and only if there's a really strong indication in terms of uh, you know cardiac dysfunction preoperatively. So it's uh, it's you know it was absolutely life saving in these case scenarios that you showed, and it just uh, you know gives us pause to think about whether or not we're missing opportunities to intervene more, despite the fact that you know as an suggests there's probably no widespread studies that show significant clinical impact, but the numbers are probably going to have to be huge in order for you to catch a signal, right? So so it's just interesting to to see. We have another question in the chat here from uh, Victor Nera from Halifax, and he asks, uh, what dose of TPA do you use in these cases? So, hi, hi, Victor. Okay. Can, you, can, can anyone do it? Does anyone want to go first? It's fine. I can. So in, in my place, I usually use, I start with two milligrams and I go to four if the clot is big and it doesn't go away. Uh, some of my colleagues here actually prefer to start with heparin first. They give 5,000 heparin, they wait for the clot to dissolve, they say. Uh, it usually goes away. I've noticed that in their cases. But if it doesn't work, uh, they have to go to TPA also. So that's the first dose, two milligrams and then four. I think that's what's in the literature too, in okay. the case reports that, at least. That is exactly what we do here in London. And uh, uh, TPA is not in the OR. It takes a couple minutes to arrive, so uh, we uh, we also give five thousand units of heparin if we see a clot. And this became such a 
an interesting topic here, uh, multidisciplinary discussed uh, that we end up deciding to administer um, heparin three to 5,000 units before the clamp for the high melt patients. So yeah, we, we do five. that in our place too. We give 2,000 of heparin on every case. And we're, we're monitoring the ACTs just to see what happens. And it's it so variable. It doesn't help. ACT is not a good indicator. It's all over the place, you know. Yes. So it's, it depends on the fibrinogen. It, it's very complicated. But one thing, one interesting thing is that these patients usually they have the worst coagulation derangements because they're so sick. And uh, although we give heparin, we didn't notice an increase in the bleeding mm -hmm. at a point that we, we haven't given protamine after reperfusion to any of these patients that I can recall. So we, we just never gave protamine. So this leads to our next question, actually, from the chat, which are uh, which and what dose of antithrombolytics are using? Uh, initially, let's uh, start by answering this question for liver transplant. But I actually want to hear what people's uh, opinions and and um, experiences are with antithrombolytics and lung transplant, especially those on ECMO, um, just because we're starting to move in that direction at our center. I would love to hear what other people are doing. So first off, we'll say, what are the dose of antithrombolytics uh, that we're using in liver transplant these days at the so very Two to four milligrams. We start with two, we go to four. I think we have the same practice. So, as boluses infusion or bolus, bolus. And is that informed at all by uh, what you see on the road stem, or is it just empiric? Is what we no, just based on the TE. Mm -hmm. and, and in Miami, is there any re resistance to administering some uh, coagulation products such as octaplex, which are a little bit controversial in liver transplant? Uh, we do, but only after uh, the artery is done. I see, I see. But if if it was indicated, you would have no problem giving that? If we have to, yeah. Okay. And uh, Rafael? Yeah, same doses here too, to four milligrams. We, we try to avoid um, coagulation treatment as much as possible before reperfusion. Uh, we don't have any contraindications for it. We, we still give preference to FFP uh, in, uh, or clot reposition. Uh, and we do use a lot of fibrinogen concentrate, um, but there is no contra, there's no pushback for octaplex or other PCC use here. We just, you know, center preference. So we still use FFP. Sure, sure, I understand. And then Jenny Ilium, um, do you routinely use antithrombolytics in lung transplant? So you might be muted. No, we don't. We don't. We don't use that. I see. We, just out of curiosity, so the discussion that was happening here is that we uh, analyzed what the transfusion rate was within the first one or two days of transplant. And our transfusion rate here, despite the fact that, you know, um, experientially, we would think that not many of our lung transplants get blood products in the OR. It seems that within the first, you know, 24 to 48 hours of transplant, about 80%, 70, 80% were getting transfused, which kind of initiated a quality assurance product of whether we were missing an uh, project to determine whether we were missing an opportunity to give antithrombolytics in, a, in an attempt to try to minimize some blood products uh, administration in these patients. Um, do you have, do you have any, uh, any similar experience at uh, Miami in terms of your rate of transfusion? I think, uh, I mean, this is anecdotal from what I've done here versus in Toronto. Uh, I think that, you know, if I see a hemoglobin of, you know, 7.8, then I'm going to transfuse. I think it was here, but I think in Toronto, they're like, just wait till it drifts down a little bit. But I think that's what's causing the po that's my that was my first thought that that's what's causing the post transplant transfusion that they got a little bit of fluid and then they dropped down. Right, right, I understand. And sometimes and, also I notice that it's very much uh, a surgeon driven. So surgeons uh, will tolerate a very low, you know, hematic in the cases, and they will be okay to you just know, hold on on any products. Uh, some surgeon will be asking you to, you know, give you know blood, give products. So I, that is, you know, it's, it's a thing that I, I I have noted throughout the years that varies the most. Who is doing the case, you know, and what their preference are. And is there any resistance to a use of FFP in lung transplant, given that it has a high antigenic potential and, and potentially highest risk of developing 
uh, respiratory complications after, or is that not really a concern? Not, not between us and the surgeon. I think the limiting factor is pharmacy that when you ask for it, it takes so long for it to arrive unless it's pre-discussed that it's just, just call for the FFP if you need it. Okay, I understand. Okay. I'm just checking the chats here. Doesn't look like there's any additional questions. Any any additional questions or comments from our panelists at all? Okay, Thanks thank so you. much for having us, Marcus. No, Marcus thank really you for pleasure. this opportunity. No, no, thank you guys for all your hard work and participation in our symposium. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, so I think we'll wrap up the session there and we'll move on to the lunch break. Uh, we have a, a little bit of extended time. I think we can probably take about 50 minutes and we'll come back for uh, our next session at two o'clock. Okay. See y'all then. Bye. Thank you.